Lisa, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast, all the way from rainy California today. Yes, yes. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here and hanging out with you, Melissa. We, friends who are listening, you have to know that when Lisa and I first talked, we talked. I mean, we talked. I already feel like she's one of my new best friends. We're going to be talking about holiday plans after this is over. <laughs> Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself to these great folks that are tuning in today? Yeah. So my name is Lisa Michelle Zega. You already mentioned I live in California. I am a life coach. I really focus on grief and especially uh, people experiencing grief in the church, in their faith with God that often goes unrecognized, unwitnessed, unheard, and that equals unhealed. And we just can't have that. <laughs> so I work in that space. Well, I'm really glad you do work in that space. I know I'm going to learn a lot today also, and I'm going to use it in ministry and with my friends and in my own life. So let's jump in with both. All of right. Them. So where did this journey begin for you, Lisa? That is a great question. And all of a sudden, my mind went to all kinds of places, right? Um, where it became super apparent to me was when I ended a marriage of 23 years. My entire identity was disrupted. I didn't know how to relate, my, relate to myself because... So I had been this pastor's wife, homeschooling mom, Christian mentor, leader, teacher. And now I was getting a divorce. My boys didn't talk to me. Like, I didn't know how to or If I wasn't wife, mother, Christian, churchgoer, right. <laughs> who was I? Yeah. That is a lot. So it's that that I would say, and, and thankfully, thankfully, before that occurred, I had entered into a counseling relationship seven years prior at, at around 38, 39. And I would say that was my introduction to becoming a grown-up. It was the first time I recognized that I was oriented to my life as a victim. And so so there was that. And by the time this happened, I had more tools in my toolbox than had it just occurred prior. Um, but that was a start. That's a huge start. That's a so big... Being married for 23 years... You feel like that there's a point where you're just going to be married. You know, when you hit a certain year or you hit a certain time that the marriage took, for lack of a better way to describe it. And after you've been married for a long time, which 23 years can be a long time, to have that rug pulled out, that is crushing in so many ways. Plus, being a pastor's wife has its own set of difficulties and challenges and identity crises as well. So I can't imagine what all you were going through just with that. And I wasn't, I, I do want to clarify, not that it matters, but I wasn't the traditional pastor's wife, like what somebody might bring to mind. You know, we had done a church plant. The church plant did not end up surviving. I related to myself as, you know, I went to seminary with him. We were very theologically oriented. Like I said, I was 
you know, teacher extraordinaire, lots and lots of Bible knowledge. But I wasn't the one like in the South, they call her the first lady. Like you wouldn't have thought of me that way because by the time this all occurred, we were attending a church as churchgoers. Mm -hmm. And yet we had these gifts, these, you know, this way I related to who I am and what made me well, what made me important, mm -hmm. even important in the kingdom of God. So, yeah. So when you lost your marriage, you mentioned that you lost your kids, and that's a whole separate layer of grief we'll get into in a moment. But you also probably lost your church. Is yes. that fair to say? Yes. It, yeah. Everything. I I really didn't know. Like, I had not been single. I had not attended. And when this first occurred, I sought to keep going to church. And my husband, have you ever heard that word? I just dig it. It's really great, right? <laughs> and yet I don't want to minimize, you know, the beauty of marriage. Regardless, my husband and my children went to the same church. And they sat on the opposite side of the sanctuary and I could see them and they were very, my kids at the time were 15, 17, and 18. We've always been a demonstrative family in terms of affectionate. And here I was being able to see them being like, I have not thought about that specifically. Anyway, I, and you know, people and and I don't blame individuals it's not a like it's a collective struggle we have we generally don't know how to be with the suffering mm -hmm. and in church that might even be more so than in society at large because how the hell are we supposed to be with you know the people that are blessed and highly favored and happy clappy and you know <laughs> got to represent God and defend his, you know, uh, reputation. So I felt so alone in my grief and people simply didn't ask. And I showed up there and I wept through services for, I don't know, maybe I went for three services. Maybe I went to four, shoot, maybe I went to eight. And then I just left. What happened during, to your faith during this time? It grew. Not surprising. A lot of people experience a loss of faith or an absence of faith. I want to hear more about how your faith grew. Well, I will say it didn't grow in a way that was traditional, nor was it comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. um, there's a passage in scripture that says, uh, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Yeah. And I feel like that's exactly what I did. I was probably more honest with God than I've ever been. And I remember, I think, saying this out loud. Certainly, I said it within and the sentiment many times. If unconditional love is like a thing, then you're going to need to prove that. And I said all my expletives to God. Mm -hmm. And I was not worried about reading my Bible, having a quiet time, figuring. And mysteriously, you know, there's another passage that says it's your kindness that leads me to change. Mm. God is tender loving, kind. Thank you for, for sharing your authenticity with us. And I think that that shows exactly what God is seeking from us, to be exactly who we are in the moment. When we can authentically be just who we are without the veneer of success without the veneer of 
our education or our hopes or our victories when we are just so completely and utterly honest with whatever language that might entail and lay ourselves bare before God. That's when there's a real possibility for something profound to happen. That's holy ground where bushes burn and where signs appear. And it sounds like that was the type of experience that you had. Yeah. And in God's goodness, when I moved out, I moved out with the clothes on my back. I was able to be cut off from the bank account, like by all. Well, if it were not for the relational resource that I have in abundance, I genuinely would have become homeless. I would have been in a homeless situation. Now, in God's goodness, guess who I began working with? Who? That was in homeless situations. Oh, that was beautiful. And I got to be, I was coming I from a place of pain. I was walking with people. There was no top down in my interaction. Through that process, I learned so much about how to be with people. I was trained in how to be with people, but this was a whole new thing. I, mm -hmm. I didn't mention I was a life coach when my marriage <laughs> imploded. And I disqualified myself and then God shepherded me into homeless services. And I got to witness more miracles, but I knew what it was like to be depleted in resource, right? Like poverty is so many different types of resource, not just financial. And I just got to experience like literal magic. And it was a, yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful season of life. Is that where the healing began? Yes. And yeah, my, uh, the CEO of the organization I worked with, right? Like we've all been, I'm imagining, many of us have been in positions of power where we've worked with someone who didn't have the authority or the opposite. We've been the person that you know, working with someone who has uh, outwardly the, the resource, right? He treated me as an equal. And in that process of feeling so much like a failure, like I tend to orient my own natural come from is an orientation towards success or failure, right? A preoccupation with that. If you're familiar with the Enneagram, I am a three. <laughs> All right, then. <laughs> Transmitting three, extraordinary. So this um, failing at the most essential area of my life was devastating. Being treated with such utter respect in that place was so healing. And, and he believed in me. He saw something. And guess what I ended up getting to do? So I come from life coaching. I disqualified myself. Of course, I'm interested in all things human development. So now he allows me to go get trained in all these ways of how to be with people. This is informing my healing. I'm getting to serve. That's informing my healing. And, and God, unbeknownst to me, is preparing me for the future that was already there, but I had not stepped into. So yeah, lots of details. That's an amazing, amazing journey. And so many times, it's not a direct path from where we are to the top of the mountain. There are, this is what Hollywood does best, is showing the pits of despair, if you will, to borrow a line from The Princess Bride. <laughs> the Princess Bride. Sometimes we have to journey through that dark and forbidden forest and face our biggest fears and face the monsters and 
then we see that there is a path for us. And because we traveled through these difficult and uncomfortable and challenging spaces, that we're now available and able to be present to new opportunities that we never even saw coming. And that's a beautiful path. That's so right before. So I told you I was trained in several modalities. I got to do a lot of work in mental health and I did it through a peer support lens, like somebody that has lived experience, right? And now you're going to get to mentor people with the same experience or different, but you know, like similar. So I had just finished this training all around now I'm trying to think of what it was. And essentially a peer support training in mental health. Uh-huh. The training finished on a Friday. Now, fast forward, I was engaged to be married. This is Easter weekend. And he mm-hmm. dies on a Monday. Oh, oh my goodness. So... One thing in like the mental health sphere, when you're thinking about self-advocacy and and garnering support for yourself is nothing about us without us, right? Like I don't need you solving my problems in a corner without including the one who's having the experience. And there were so many other things, but I remember I sent out a text to hundreds of people When I found out that he died, like in my state of shock, my fiance died. He loved me. It was so close to April Fool's. That was the year that um, Easter fell on on April Fool's, April 1st, that Mm -hmm. some people thought it was a joke. Mm -hmm. What it also did was have me wake up to a room of eight, 10, 15 women. I don't even know. Like I was surrounded with support. And at some point that day, I heard them whispering and they, right? Like they are concerned about their devastated friend. Mm -hmm. And I yell from the other room, Melissa. (laughs) (laughs) And again, God going before me and and giving me preparation and to grieve, to get the support I needed, and to help me recognize grief. All of us, all of us experience it. Of course, we all experience the death of loved ones. Grief is just the normal response to loss. Yes, it is. So much of our grief goes unidentified because there's like no category for it. We don't generally put all loss experienced by humankind Mm -hmm. in the grief bucket, right? So, And a lot of times we mistake it for anger or for something else when underneath it's really grief. Because we tend to learn to cope based on what's modeled for us or some sort of reaction against what's modeled for us, neither of which are connecting us with who we are, our essence, our inner man, you know, as the scripture would say, or yeah. Well, and I think a lot of times we take the path of least resistance. Okay, anger. Ah. Gary, I can do anger, but grief? I don't want to go there. I don't want to face that. That is frightening. I might get lost in that. Yeah. And that's not like a moral thing either. That's not like, we don't have to think about that. Our brain is like wired for survival. It's a Mm -hmm. magical machine. Neither one of us would be here were we not, you know, had we not survived to get here. And unfortunately, and, and I can speak, this is my truth, like, I used personal development against myself in many ways. I weaponized it like I was supposed to have known. I was supposed to have done better. I think neuroscience is one of the greatest gifts for me just to understand, oh, wait, like I'm here to survive. 
And then there's also a path to thrive, right? Mm -hmm. That allows me to interrupt that. But I don't want to poo poo on survival. Like, hello, we are here because we survive. That's a big part of it. <laughs> so Lisa, to someone who is in the in the vice grip of grief right now, who is losing their faith, what would you say to that person? It's okay to not be okay. You know, some of the things that keep us from healing are the pressure to act better than we are. Mm. And we all experience this. We are tribal beings because there's not a lot of space for our grief in normal culture and within the church. At some point, we give the people what the people want. They mm. want to see Melissa. Let's get back to your good old energetic self. We miss your laugh. We this, we that. And so... It, it creates a greater sense of isolation, right? So recognizing we've got lots and lots of misinformation in society. There's nothing wrong with you. What's wrong is our messaging around grief. We are not meant to do this alone. We are not protecting people when we pretend that we're okay. And in fact, when we allow ourselves to feel what we're feeling, within ourselves and within the presence of others, like that's what's normal. What's not normal is being told to get better, to we, we get better without the force, without the pressure, without the, this is what you're supposed to look like. This is who I need you to be. But if we find ourselves pretending for others, we haven't done anything wrong. We've done what we've been taught to do. So I would say, um, allow it. Pick someone that you can trust to talk to. Give them guidelines. Like, people need to know that you're okay. Like, it, I don't like how this is coming out, Melissa. It's the idea of, I'm going to talk and allow myself to be exactly how I am. Mm -hmm. What I want is you to listen, not interrupt or try to fix. I'm mm -hmm. not looking for advice. Yeah. People's natural response is to try to give advice and make you okay. You're already okay. You're having a normal experience. Grief is the appropriate response to loss. Exactly. It is appropriate. It's the appropriate. It is the normal. And it's natural. What's not natural is the numbing and the pretending. But even if you're numbing, of course you are. We do what we're taught. And we're not just taught this in our family of origin, which we are, but it's a collective. It's bigger than us. Mm -hmm. which, right? So your entire life's been disrupted. And that's why I'm saying... It is okay to not feel okay, and you do not need to pretend. You know, an image that came to mind as you were speaking about this was, do you remember those finger puzzles you'd get at little carnivals and little things that you, you have your fingers in them, and then you can't pull them out? The only way to get your fingers back out is to just relax and succumb to it, push them together. And then it will give and you can remove it. You it's can remove counterintuitive. It is. But we see it throughout nature, throughout like, yes, leaning. I remember um, I, I met a woman who did the wild river rafting. Mm -hmm. And you know how stories stick with us. And I don't remember the levels, but she did the highest level. And she said, the natural response when you're coming up to a boulder, you know, being, being pushed through this rapid is to move away. And the safest thing to do is to lean in. <laughs> you literally end up hugging it and you make your way through. And, and that, all those things. So by the time Chip died, 
I knew to lean in. I knew that my only path forward was to allow the grief. Yeah. And uh, one other thing, though, and my that same CEO who I love, his name is Damien O'Farrell. I think I can say his name just because I want to celebrate him. He allowed me to write a letter to the entire organization because I told him they don't know how to be with me. And unless I tell them, it is so awkward here, I can't come into the office. Hmm. So I wrote a letter with an appeal that I am human. I am suffering. I'm still allowed to laugh. I'm still allowed to tell jokes. I don't need to talk about his death all the time. And I will cry when I need to cry without worrying about whether it's appropriate. And Mm -hmm. and somehow them knowing, like I basically told people, I'm going to go through a process. I don't know what it's going to look like. I'm going to allow it. And I'm inviting you to allow it with me. Now, I had an entire organization of support who was not walking around on, you know, broken glass trying to make sure that I didn't break. So that's beautiful. And it takes some strength to be able to do that. That's not something you might be able to do on, in the first moments of grief. But as I you're think wanting, that I was in a situation like, honestly, I wouldn't expect that of anyone. It just happened to be like even the idea that I'd been in a two or three week long training right up until two days before he died. It was like I was being surrounded with support in preparation that and and I wouldn't expect myself to be present to that somehow miraculously I was. But I would never, ever, ever want someone to hold my views, story, process. Like, there's not a standard one size fits all. And that's another, it's a tragedy to think so. It's like our grief is as unique as our fingerprint, you know? Absolutely. So is our journey. (laughs) How big is God for you now? So big. And look, I want to say, and so small. And it's like manna. This is the thing. I've, and I'm saying this for all the people like me who just want to arrive at a place where I've got this thing down and now I don't need God in the same way. It's like, no. Now, every day, at some point when I slow down to myself and to my fears and to my anxiety and all the things that still happen in this human body, I come again to see the bigness of God. Hmm. And sometimes I I just need to laugh at sometimes how small the things are that will have me shrink God down to the size of, you know, I don't know, this itsy witsy teeny beeny and then and then I sit with it and then God grows again and I'm like oh I'm not gonna outgrow this whole human experience am I I I get to be with it Lisa your story is so inspiring and you have created space by sharing your story for others to be able to grieve the way they want and need to grieve. By sharing this with us today, you have given someone who is listening a respite, a place to say, I might be all right, and I might find a way through this. But whenever, if ever that happens right now, I'm okay. I'm as I should be. So thank you for that. That's a tremendous gift you've given. And I appreciate you so much for showing up today and for sharing that story with us. And do you have any last words for someone who might be listening today? We don't move on from our loss. We move on with it. We get to keep, like, some people are afraid that, like, I'm letting them go. I'm moving beyond them. You're carrying them with you. Like, 
as we allow grief to assimilate within us, I would say grief is love. Mm-hmm. To deny this, these parts of you that have experienced loss, to deny your grief is to deny love for these parts, to deny love for your people. So we want to retain all the memories, all the goodies, and we want to release. Like there's unfinished business in every situation with every person. And we want to be able to release that and retain the goodness. And that's what the grief journey does for us. Um, I'd love for people to reach out to me with any questions or thoughts or just and and I love working with people on this journey. And for the Christians out there, I'd say we don't need to protect God. God is here healing and protecting us. And so to say that I was wronged or even to say, I believe I was wronged by you, God, or like God is big enough for your pain, like all of it. Beautiful. Thank you, Lisa. And friend, if you want to follow Lisa, get in touch with Lisa. All of the information you need to do that is in the show notes. So make sure you check it out and click on the links and follow her on social media and check out what she has to offer. She's an amazing human being.